continue till 5:30 you know i can't i don't talk a lot i am i am very uh, i am very short in my uh, submissions in court and outside the court <laughs> you speak uh, relevant pratik bhai jo batane tumhe mute kar sakte you have to tell everybody to unmute yeah yeah, yeah we'll, we'll mute also uh, good afternoon friends i welcome you all in this very first lg thakkar memorial lecture organized by tech advocate association gujarat friends before we formally start i would request pratik bhai patel the honorary secretary to play the tag moto song which has been the precedent in all our program done sir senior advocate supreme court of india founding president and founding member of tech advocate association shri dt shah sir c asim bhai thakkar son of shri lg thakkar sir advocate varish isani ji past president and convener of study circle of tech advocate association other past presidents of the association and my dear friends i welcome you all in this memorial lecture organized in memory of our past president and one of the founding members of tech advocate association friends almost all of us knew lg thakkar sir personally but today we have many non members in this program and members who have joined the association after demise of shri lg thakkar sir so let me briefly talk about the lives and times of shri lg thakkar sir uh, lg thakkar sir was uh, born on 6th of december 1930 education wise he did his ba economics and politics he did his llb he started his practice in uh, income tax in the year 1956 he was a specialist so far as the cases of search seizure and settlement were concerned he was the president of the income tax bar association in the year 1973 he was the president of our association the tax advocate association in the year 1977 he was vice president of the all gujarat federation of tax consultants he was the honorary joint secretary of all india federation of tax practitioners he was also honorary secretary of income tax appellate tribunal bar association he was appointed by the government of gujarat as the director of the gujarat aromatics limited he gave his services as the vice president of the income tax appellate tribunal bar association he also gave his services and was appointed as the by the central government as member of the gujarat tax advisory board in the year 1983-84 he was the member in taxation sub committee of the gujarat chamber of commerce and industry he pro, uh, gave lectures as well as articles at various forums apart from this he was socially active and was president of the lions club of amdavad main in the year 1986-87 he was the zone chairman of the lions club international district 323b in the year 1987-88 he was the trustee of luhana kanya chatralay amdavad also the trustee of 
Luhana Higher Education Board, Ahmedabad. Apart from this, he was quite active so far as the sporting activities were concerned. He was the chairman of the Ahmedabad Basketball Association. He was the chairman of Jakwada uh, Vikas Board, his native uh, in the Taluka Viramga. Friends, what we can see and we can easily make out that LG Thakkar had left his imprints across professional, social, and even sporting institutions. And believe me, Tech's Advocate Association had a very special place in his art. And many past presidents and senior members who are in this program are evident to that fact. It is an honor for the association that his son, CA Asim Thakkar, sir, is with us today on this occasion of the first memorial lecture in memory of LG Thakkar, sir. Sri Asim Bhai also happens to be the honorary auditor of our association since long. Friends, as a, as a token of love and affection, I would request past president Sri Rakesh Bhai Thakkar to give a floral welcome to Asim Bhai Thakkar, sir. Friends, with a huge round of applause to Asim Thakkar, sir, the son of LG Thakkar, sir. Friends, on this occasion, I would request Asim Thakkar, sir, to say a few words befitting the occasion of the memorial lecture of Sri L.P. Thakkar, sir. Over to you, Asim Bhai. Thank you, Sunil Bhai. President Sunil Bhai, respected Nushan Bhai, T.T. Shah, sir, other office members of the association, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, I'm very honored and humbled to be a part of this first LG Thakkar Memorial Lecture. Privileged that I am of being his son, I knew how close this association was to his heart. Being a founder member, he went on to become this, its president in 1977. Until his last, he was very actively involved in all the affairs of the association. The annual event, the mega event, the seminar, he used to look forward to it each year. Actively, he used to sit down with the president, discuss who is going to be a part of the faculty, and not, a, not only to the uh, academic part of the seminar, but even he would love to sit down and see what the menu is, what food is going to be organized, who's going to be the caterer. So that, that was his you know, fun food fraternity. That was his life. That was his motto. He used to live to the press. And this, this has, you know, uh, it has uh, come to the entire family. My wife was, uh, uh, my mother, she also used to be very actively involved in the seminar when it used to take place as a chairperson. And when Rasila Ben became the first woman president, the question arose that now who will head the ladies wing? So that mantle was handed over to my wife and she became the ladies wing chairman because I was not even a primary member and I could not be a primary member of this association. And he was very passionate about its existence, its growth. There have been earlier attempts to sabotage this association in Dhiresh Kaka, Pankaj Bhai Vyas, my father, all of them. They stood fast and saw that this young sapling of this tax advocate blossomed into a wonderful tree, which gave shade and fruits to everybody. I am deeply honored that this lecture series has been uh, organized. And wherever my father upstairs is, I'm sure he'll be cherishing this moment. I'm very thankful to this association for this honor bestowed upon us. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you, Asim Bhai, sir. As I told a lot of seniors, the past presidents are evident of the fact that Tech Advocate Association has been fortunate to receive the services of LG Thakkar and family, your mother, Pravina Ben, you as an honorary auditor of the association, and Bindu Madam also. Friends, now, coming to the uh, subject for the today, friends, we all have been practicing tax laws, but I think very few or largely all of us are restricted to studying only the taxing statutes. The vast majority of us are not aware of anything with regard to the taxation except the taxing statutes. With regard to the tax statutes, which we refer day in and day out, we might not know what are the constitutional rights the fundamental rights uh, of the taxpayer, the role of evidence act vis-a-vis -vis the taxation laws, whether there is any overlapping of power between the state and the center, double taxation, or things like that. 
friends to discuss and deliberate on this particular subject. We are very fortunate and privileged to have with, with us Mr. Du Dushyan Dave, sir, Senior Advocate of the Supreme Court and the former President of the Supreme Court Bar Association. The formal introduction of Dushyan Dave, sir, is for Varis Isaniji to do. But personally, to me, I have heard Dushyan Dave, sir, from various platforms, and the two most striking characteristics of him, which I may say with certainty, is he is always there. And he stands for the common man and woman of this country, be it COVID, be it tax terrorism, or any other issue pertaining to the larger public interest of the society. And he is someone who calls a spade a spade, even to the powers that may be. With these words and with huge round of applause, I once again welcome you all to this first memorial lecture of LG Thakkar, sir. And I hand over the charge to Vari Sisaniji without whose support, this lecture would not have been conceived, would not have been materialized. Over to you, Varish. Varish Ishani, sir. Thank you, Sunil Bhai. Good evening to everyone. On behalf of the Text Advocate Association, Gujarat, and on my personal behalf, I welcome all the participants in this memorial lecture in the memory of Sri L.G. Thakkar, sir. Friends, L.G. Thakkar, sir, our founder, one of the founder members of our association, along with Dheeraj T. Shah sir and T.K. Vyas sir, who has started this association a long back. I remember that before a few years back, I think maybe uh, 15 or 20 years back, when K.T. Thakur sir was there, they have developed such idea of having TAG debate competition, TAG award. That was the brainchild of all these people where they were encouraging the junior advocates and members of the bar or the association. And in the debate competition, they were given some subject like income tax at that time, VAT was there earlier, sales tax was there to speak on a particular subject for 10 minutes. That debate and the TAG award continues every year. And after the death of LG Thakkar, sir, his son, Charter Accountant Naseem Bhai Thakkar, who is an honorary auditor of our association since last so many years. He has generously contributed a fund for this TAG award. Unfortunately, due to this COVID pandemic, we could not organize this TAG award. So the idea muted in the mind of the association to do this memorial lecture in the memory of LG Thakkar, sir. LG Thakkar, sir, his wife, Praveena Ben, were absolutely affectionate. They were having so much affection for this association. And as the same legacy has been continued by his son, C.A. Asim Bhai Thakkar, and his wife, Bindu Ben, also. He is also a member of our association. A wife of Asim Bhai, daughter-in-law of L.G. Thakkar, sir, and daughter of Krishna Kandai Vakharia. Bindu Ben is also contributing a lot as far as our association is concerned. When we were discussing to arrange this lecture, what could be the subject and who will be the speaker. In fact, before a couple of years, a couple of days back, I was discussing with Manish Joshi, our past president, and we were discussing about one of the interview of Dushyan by Dave, sir. So immediately that idea prompted in our mind that why not to call Dushyan Dave, sir? He will be the right and the correct person to discuss about, to speak about the constitutional right, the fundamental right, Indian Evidence Act, vis-a-vis -vis taxation law from the perspective of the taxpayer. I am also thankful to Manish Bhai Joshi for the instrumental for selecting this subject also. He has also worked very hard. Friends, we are really indeed lucky to have a personality who is having a roots from Gujarat. Dushyan Bhai Dave, popularly known as DD in the group. He is a senior advocate in the Supreme Court and former president of Supreme Court Bar Association. He has been president of the Supreme Court Bar Association for three terms, friends. Friends, Dushyan Bhai Dave has started his practice in the year 1981 in the Gujarat. And he has worked as a junior with S.P. Majmudar sir also and with Shailat sir also. Dushyan Dave sir has practiced in Gujarat and then after he shifted to full-time functioning the practice as advocate in the Supreme Court 
way back in the year 1990 and he was designated as a senior advocate of the supreme court in the year 1994 late pd desai is having a good impact as far as his career is concerned pd desai is considered to be a role model for the dushyant dave sir his parents is also having a good impact as far as his development of the personality is concerned his father was a respected judge and he want his father wants that dushyant dave sir should join a civil service but this is a passion of the dushyant dave sir in the college days that he joined this legal profession and reached to the height of the highest peak of the profession by practicing as a senior advocate very efficiently and very smartly friends our today speaker is a fond of driving is a devoted golf player and he is having the hobby of reading books and listening music friend our speaker is practicing since last over four decades and he was a member of national legal service authority during the year 2004 appointed by government of india he has served on board of leading international arbitration association he has been practicing advocate senior advocate of the supreme court and regularly defends public causes both inside and outside the courts friends he loves to practice as far as constitutional aspects are concerned as far as public lit interest litigations are concerned as far as arbitration are concerned friends he is a regular column writer in very leading newspapers of our country last the president is rightly stated that whenever there is a public cause he speaks very boldly and clearly friends when the covid 19 decision was came when the argument was going on before the supreme court and supreme court has given some remarks as far as his remarks on the order is concerned what is the temperament of the advocate what is the fearless bold personality dushyant dave sir is he stated that i must strongly refute that i intend to impute motives to the court much less without reading the order those who know me well enough and i am sure lordship of the supreme court do as well know that i do not means words in calling a spade a spade if i criticize the court i do so objectively and openly and my criticism has never been subjective in the past or even now i respect the institution as others do and it is only out of that respect that i derive the strength to criticize the functioning of the courts and their decisions but only when i find them to be worthy of criticism i am therefore deeply anguished that the judges whom i hold in very high esteem should have at all made this observation as a member of bar and an officer of the court it is my duty to comment on such matters of great public importance i did so because i do believe that court ought not to have taken shoe motor cognizance in the matter particularly when the high courts which are equally competent and constitutional courts knowing local conditions for better had stepped in to save lives of the citizen this is in context of the covid 19 so dushyant dave sir whether it is a covid 19 whether it is related to the functioning of the court the functioning of the judges whether it is a farmer agitations or wherever there is a public interest he very boldly and fearlessly speak out the things whether it is in the form of a criticism or it is in the form of the good nature of his remarks so we are very much fortunate and lucky to have a very very bold and a charming personality as far as our profession is concerned friends a big big round of applause we welcome our today speaker shri dushyant dave sir to speak on the subject of constitutional rights fundamental rights and indian evidence indian evidence act 
vis-a-vis taxation perspectives and from the perspectives of the taxpayer. Friends, Dushyant Dave sir is requested, if possible, to have a mixed language of Hindi and English, sir. And if you add something in Gujarati, it will be like a topping which we are getting free of cost. Thank you so much. And with big round of applause, we welcome Dushyan Dave sir to deliver his talk. Uh, sir, the floral welcome is pending, sir. Varish Bhai. Sir, I request. The past president of Tech Advocate Association, Andy Patel, would be giving the floral welcome. Andy Patel, sir, to give a floral welcome. This is sir a virtual floral welcome, sir, but the fragrance are real, sir. Andy Patel, sir, is our past president. Thank you so much, sir. Sir, floor is yours for next another whatever time you want, sir. <laughs> Good afternoon, friends, Mr. Keshwani. Mr. Isani, Mr. Pinakin Patel, Mr. Pratik Patel, Mr. Pankaj Shah, Mr. Vasan Patel, members of the Managing Committee of the, <clears throat> uh, of the Tax Advocates Association of Gujarat, the distinguished members of the association, respected Mr. Shah, and, in, and very dear Rasik Bhai Thakkar. <clears throat> it indeed is a I would say a privilege and also a pleasure to be here this evening. More so because when I accepted the invitation, which was virtually like a summons from Mr. Isani, I did not know that we will be honoring uh, I, uh, Ms. late Mr. L.G. Thakkar and that I would be the one who will be inaugurating the memorial lecture series in his honor. I had the privilege of knowing Sri L.G. Thakkar personally, although not so intimately, but I knew him at the bar. I knew the, the vast practice that he commanded at the bar, the respect that he commanded in society at large. And uh, uh, whenever I went to Kashmira chambers where his office is where, uh, uh, whenever I came from Delhi, I would always make it a point to say hello to him. And uh, sometimes when he was in a jovial mood, he would offer a cup of tea also. <laughs> so I'm, it's really a, a great privilege uh, to be here this evening because uh, Mr. Thakkar's contribution to society and to the cause of law has been really uh, immense. And it is therefore absolutely uh, you know, the right thing for this uh, great association founded by him to honor him with this uh, lecture series. And I congratulate the association for uh, starting this lecture series. And I do hope and trust that the lecture series will continue uh, with uh, many distinguished uh, speakers in uh, years to come in his uh, memory. Uh, the whole purpose, as your motto rightly said, Gyan, knowledge. Uh, you know, this is very important. Knowledge to bada paase hoi chhe, Gyan bada paase hoi chhe. Pane ek deshna sacha nagrik tarikhe, ane apne vakilo jarur chhe, pane apne nagrik pehla chhe. एक नागरिक तरीके एक वकील तरीके अपनी एक फरज बने छे के कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन में बंधारण विषय आपरु ज्ञान खूबज सारू होवो चाहिए अने जो बंधारण विषय आपरु ज्ञान सारू हसे तो एक नागरिक तरीके आपरे सारी रीते रही सकीशु अने एक वकील तरीके आपरे समाज नी एक सारी सेवा करी सकु छु दी डिफिकल्टी इज दैट कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन इज अ फॉरगॉटन डॉक्यूमेंट इन दिस कंट्री डॉक्टर अंबेडकर described this constitution as the fundamental document. And he said, of course, he had, even in 1949, he had expressed serious reservations about the success of the constitution. But he did say that constitution will fail, not because the draft of the constitution is bad, because as you all know, the constituent assembly consisted of some of the greatest men and women that India has ever produced and led by Dr. Ambedkar and of course under the presidentship of late Dr. Rajendra Prashad, Constituent Assembly really debated the constitution threadbare for almost two years. They have produced a document which I can assure you is no less, no less sacrosanct than the Gita, the Bible, the Quran and Guru Granth Sahib. 
it is an absolutely amazing document and unless and until we read the constituent assembly debates we will never know as to what all went into making of this document it's not what we see in parliament today when most important of the laws are passed without any debate whatsoever in you know hurried sessions uh, by uh, just because the majority uh, you know wishes that they should be passed constituent assembly was absolutely a democratic institution and under the presidency of dr rajendra prasad it, its members were allowed complete freedom of exchange of ideas some of the greatest names were there from amongst the gujaratis uh, you know uh, kanayala and munshi uh, uh, kt shah these people were absolutely mind blowing of course leaders like sardar patel jawaharlal nehru and many others were also contributing but i must say if you read constituent assembly debates you will find that the contribution by likes of kt shah and uh, kanayala and munshi is absolutely outstanding outstanding now this is the document which unfortunately has not received the respect that it should receive from the powers be as also from the citizens very few people really understand what really constitution provides you know if you look at the preamble of the constitution and ambedkar you know uses the word very beautifully he calls preamble's first part as a declaration because preamble says we the people of india are giving us this document now therefore in every generation this document becomes a live document every generation is giving this document to itself for the purpose of defining not only not for the purpose of creating not just the organs of the state the legislature the parliament the executive the government or the judiciary but to define and limit their roles and their powers and this is very important because as ambedkar said if you do not define the roles and limits of the powers of these three organs it will result in anarchy judiciary will do whatever it wants to do executive will do whatever it wants to do and parliament will pass any law that it wants to do now to check that the three organs of the state were created for the purpose of checks and balance so that the constitution can function in a very organized in a very synchronized manner and can subserve the people of the country the whole purpose as the preamble clearly tells us is to create a society where there is equality where there is social and economic justice where there is fraternity and this all this with under secular uh, state we have to achieve now this is where it is important for us to understand that ultimately if economic justice is to be achieved then taxing laws become extraordinarily important so to my mind as you rightly pointed out gyan the knowledge of constitution law is paramount amongst that knowledge and we must therefore understand constitution as best as we can <clears throat> the subject of today's discussion is extremely wide constitutional rights fundamental rights evidence act from the perspective of a, a taxation laws and from the perspective of a taxpayer it's a very it's a very very i would say extremely uh, wide subject and it would be impossible to really debate it in a you know uh, uh, at one go it will require series of you know debates with all of you i don't intend to take much time of uh, all of you i would welcome question and answers if there are but i will give you broad insight of what i feel is very important which we as tax lawyers and mind you i also love tax laws i began in fact my practice very seriously on indirect tax laws and uh, practiced very very uh, i would say uh, successfully on, on uh, indirect taxes like excise customs and sales tax for a long time and uh, till i made a transformation and went into all, all the general laws when i went to supreme court and stressing into public law and particularly constitution law later in my life Uh, unlike what uh, mr isani said i began my practice not in 1981 but 1978 in gujarat high court uh, i did start with late uh, justice majmudar one of the finest human beings and a great lawyer and then i was with uh, suresh bhai shalat for some time but uh, really speaking
the uh, the the practice uh, uh, the nuances of practice uh, were picked up uh, by me along with uh, late uh, kirit raval former solicitor general of india uh, uh, justice uh, chief justice mohit shah justice anil bhai dave uh, we all were uh, appointed to appear on behalf of the government solicitors who used to in those days defend government of gujarat in the high court ambu bhai and divan ji bhai shankar kanga and company and purnanand and company we as young lawyers of course all these people were senior to me i was the youngest amongst them we were given the task of uh, defending the government till the admission stage opposing admission of writ petitions particularly and grant of interim relief and uh, those were the days when i mean the gujarat high court was perhaps the greatest court that one could ever envis envision it to be uh, under the leadership of none other than chief justice bj divan one of the finest votaries of uh, taxation laws and of course judges like uh, p d desai whom i consider to be the greatest judge that uh, post independence india has uh, produced uh, but besides that justice sakar chand said uh, justice amadi uh, justice mp thakkar uh, you name them these judges were absolutely absolutely top class today to find this kind of judges is with greatest respect to the serving judges is virtually impossible even if you go with a lamp you might not be able to find any judge comparable to these uh, you know giants all at that time i think there were 16 judges when i started my practice and each one was better than the other their knowledge of law their handling of the court their respect for the bar their sense of justice for the litigant everything was extraordinary and you know we were very fortunate that uh, we could uh, you know learn in that kind of an atmosphere in that kind of a legal environment i would say and we therefore really picked up uh, and uh, all four of us were very richly rewarded uh, ultimately in our career because of these judges so that's something which uh, we have to really bear in mind so constitutional rights qua taxation laws you have to remember four articles very carefully article 14 that article 14 not only prohibits discrimination but also prohibits arbitrariness and this is something very important for tax lawyers to understand that no action of the taxing authorities which is arbitrary in any sense supposing they pass an order without hearing it's arbitrary supposing they pass any order which is dehors their powers it's arbitrary supposing they pass an order which is totally excessive i mean let's say the income of a uh, ssc is 1 crore and he is assessed at uh, 10 crore or 20 crore or somebody who is not even liable to be taxed under the law and is being taxed and it will be treated as violative of uh, as arbitrary and violative of article 14 article 14 is very very crucial for us to understand and if we understand article 14 and how to invoke our article 14's you know amplitude its width in questioning every order of an assessing authority every demand we will really view it very differently from a very different perspective so this is something which we must understand that and why it is important is that if you look at article 265 of the constitution there shall be uh, Uh, no tax shall be levied except without the authority of law shall be levied now that authority is very important so income tax excise customs gst whatever you say even octroi every tax or fee which is sought to be levied must find authority in a statute if there is no authority in statute if it is not permissible by statute it is uh, unlawful uh, you know recovery or un unlawful imposition it is without jurisdiction and that is what is important it automatically becomes arbitrary and violative of article 14 likewise article 14 also strikes at discrimination we are all confronted every day and you see that in your vast practices every day ke एक बे मणस की सामने टैक्स एज सब्जेक्ट पर दे विल डिमांड और बीजा वीस मणस सामने नहीं डिमांड करे वी ऑल नो व्हाई टैक्स अथॉरिटीज डू दैट इफ द एसएससीज कैन कीप देम हैप्पी दे विल नॉट सेंड द डिमांड नोटिसेस इफ द एसएससीज कैन सेटिस्फाई देयर रिक्वेस्ट देन दे विल बी सेटल्ड विद डिमांड्स नाउ आर्टिकल 14 प्रोहिबिट्स डिस्क्रिमिनेशन 
and this is something we must test all the time and you are entitled to there are judgments of the supreme court to the effect that discrimination is a valid point even from the perspective of taxation laws and therefore if you find that while your client is sought to be taxed for the same reason for the same basis for the same action or for the same uh, taxable event b or c or d are not being taxed it's clearly discriminatory or for example the assessing authorities in gujarat are more uh, i would say zealous than anywhere else in india for the same uh, uh, same taxable event or same you know transaction they will seek to tax a gujarat assessee but they will not tax an assessee in uh, bihar or up for whatever reason now you are therefore entitled to invoke article 14 on behalf of your client and you must start raising this point from the day you respond to the show cause notice it's not enough that this point is for the first time raised before the high court no yeah. if it is because high court will ask us that did you mr dave raise this before the authority and if you didn't raise why should we permit you to raise it of course high court may not be right there because point as to constitutional violations can be raised anywhere but it is always important to raise it at a first stage and then persuade the authorities at every level to accept your argument so article 14 is one aspect which is very very crucial article 265 as I, as i told you is very important that you cannot levy tax without the authority of law and supreme court's decisions large number of decisions ujjambai's case coffee board's case you take all these decisions in of the mm -hmm. constitution entities of the supreme court where supreme court has said that if the tax is sought to be levied which is without the authority of law it is without jurisdiction and if it is without jurisdiction the assessee is entitled to challenge that demand at any stage directly going to the high court or the supreme court under articles 226 or 32 and it need not exhaust the alternative remedy this view has also been taken by the gujarat high court's constitution bench five judge bench of the gujarat high court way back in 1977 in amdavad manufacturing and calico printing case and uh, uh, i think it was a bench which was led by justice uh, late uh, justice jb mehta as he then was and that bench has very categorically following ujjambai and coffee board said that yes assessee can come to us in high court and we can't drive him to an alternative remedy if he can prime of his i show that the demand is without jurisdiction or authority or in violation of principles of natural justice so this is something very important for us to understand these two articles then there is article 300 capital a of the constitution of india no although it's no longer a fundamental right but right to property is still a constitutional right and nobody can be deprived of his property without due process of law without the authority of law and this is something which we have to really you know uh, understand and expand every time we because these are all articles which are correlated to each other L last but most important article is 191g right to carry on business and if there is an unreasonable demand made it certainly obstructs the freedom of carrying on business of an assessee and therefore article 191g really comes into play these four articles together in my uh, respectful view are really the fulcrum of the constitutional mechanism or constitutional protection to the assessees in taxation laws and these articles are singularly very very important not only to understand the very basis of any taxation law but on the for the purpose of its interpretation for the purpose of understanding scope and ambit of any levy be it under income tax excise customs or gst is concerned so this is something which we have to constantly bear in mind when you know we as lawyers are confronted with uh, you know taxing problems and uh, uh, you know this is uh, i must tell you that from the perspective of the income tax laws the contribution of the gujarat high court which you all must have seen Uh, since 1960s when justice bhagwati used to be here in the gujarat high court uh, and uh, especially uh, throughout uh, you know later years by justice jb mehta justice p d desai justice b k mehta uh, uh, chief justice divan all these judges have really laid down phenomenal principles so far as income tax laws are concerned
and these judgments of the gujarat high court were path breaking at that point of time and many of these judgments are today even guiding lights for you know taxation jurisprudence across the country most of these judgments have found favor with the supreme court supreme court didn't upset them so you know these principles all of you are very familiar with and you know how these principles have been uh, you know invoked by the judges of the gujarat high court and how they can be implemented our problem is today what our problem is completely unjustified and illegal actions on the part of the taxation authorities we know that there is no rule of law which is prevalent in implementation of taxation laws it is rule of jungle and the tax authorities can harass anyone and everyone of course i must say one thing and this is very important for us to remember that there is a distinction between honest tax payers and those tax payers who want to take law into their own hands and it is this later you know group of people who suffer it the most the honest tax payers really are not made to suffer i have been a tax payer since 1978 and i can tell you one thing i have never seen income tax office in my 42 years i have never communicated with any income tax officer and not once my tax return has ever been questioned if at all i have received refunds from time to time now it is therefore you know i have made it very clear to my chartered accountant and you know one of your most distinguished members samir bhai devetia has advised me for many years and so does amal bhai dhru uh, today and i have always made it very clear to them that one thing i would never want to do is to really uh, you know seek any kind of a favor from an income tax authorities therefore always tell me always guide me so that i don't have to depend on them they have to depend on me and give me the refund so that makes it a very happy uh, situation when you get a refund you feel nice about it that yes you are getting something back from the authorities so the honest tax payers really don't uh, have to worry a lot but that doesn't mean uh, that's because we are you know lawyers generally we are i think treated little better than ordinary citizens are because the tax authorities also know that the lawyers there is no point you know taking a confrontation with the lawyers and uh, you know it's better to uh, uh, stay clear of them the ordinary citizens even honest ordinary citizens business people especially have to really suffer very seriously because of the high handedness on the part of the tax authorities and this is where our role as income tax or tax lawyers comes into being because when these uh, you know assessees are being harassed by procedural you know uh, uh, this thing requirements i mean uh, completely uncalled for and unlawful searches again and again in assessees homes nobody can stop them nobody can do anything about it during the search their conduct is really i would say uh, sad uh, and it is very disrespectful to citizens so the powers of search powers of seizure are something which should be tested all the time all the time and if you find even procedural you know irregularity in exercise in conducting a search and a seizure you are entitled to go to high court and question that and more often than not you will succeed you will succeed so this is something very important of course the other problem which is confronting the assessees and this is very uh, i would say sorry state of affairs partly because today the courts have become weaker over last 15 20 years the courts have started suspecting the assessees and uh, this is a very very sad state of development of law instead of suspecting the conduct of judges i mean uh, income tax or other tax authorities we know that there is large scale corruption amongst tax authorities we know why illegal demands are being sent on the assessees in the hope of a, a possible private settlement but the judges are not willing to understand that judges are not willing to recognize that and judges are certainly not willing to strike at them if in 100 cases in a year the gujarat high court were to set aside this kind of illegal demand straight away then i think the authorities will get a message but judges don't do that because the judges are constantly suspecting the assessees that every assessee must be a chore no i don't think that's the right approach on the part of the judges 
judges must look at the law must see whether the law really permits the demand whether the the demand has been uh, made properly whether it has been quantified properly whether it has been served properly whether it has been determined properly whether principles of natural justice have been followed or not there are million aspects in a case which judges have to examine and judges don't today by and large i mean there are exceptional judges they are very good some of them are very good judges if you go with any case which is a just case in the court of justice rohinton nariman uh, i mean tax authorities will have no say there the moment he finds that the demand is unjust he will be more than happy to strike it down straight away so there are there are judges who are very very fair and who really are willing to appreciate and understand a citizen's view point this is something which we must understand the judiciary must understand that judiciary is there to subserve the people the public interest and the public interest necessarily does not mean an income tax or excise or customs officers interest no it doesn't mean that i am not for a moment saying that in every case ssc is right but there are large number of cases where ssc's are made to suffer they win right at the end after some 10 or 15 years of fight in the high court or supreme court because we all know that you know litigation now is taking long time in uh, so uh, during that time the ssc is forced to you know pay the uh, dues which were illegal, illegal which were unauthorized and rarely are now tribunals and courts or for that matter supreme court willing to give a stay uh, in a tax matter unless of course you are uh, you know one of the largest business houses of the country then you get uh, decisions in your favor in your favor on a platter but that's an exceptional case ordinary ssc finds himself in a serious problem that he does not get protection interim protection from the courts and i'll tell you something very interesting which very few uh, people uh, perhaps uh, will uh, notice that one of the worst decisions on stay orders against the ssc is assistant collector of customs versus dunlop a 1985 supreme court judgment which is more often than not cited by government lawyers against the ssc's lawyers in the high court and supreme court but that dunlop's decision justice chinapparedi has a very beautiful paragraph while he deprecated you know grant of ex parte orders without hearing and in all kinds of matters he did say that all this is not necessary to say that interim order should never be made where gross violations of laws have taken place supreme court says it is the bounden duty it is the bounden duty of the judiciary to grant interim stay and protect this ssc the citizen so uh, this passage is singularly missed out nobody reads this passage now the other uh, same judgment has another very beautiful facet and which is this which is very very you know take for example law declared by the gujarat high court on an income tax matter on pure interpretation of a section or a notification issued under income tax act now that decision by the gujarat high court binds every authority and every ssc within the state of gujarat nobody can you know get out of it but you will yet find that day in and day out the authority supposing that decision is against the income tax department day in and day out income tax authorities will go on issuing notices after notices on the ssc now this is completely unacceptable because law declared by a high court is the law which binds everybody in the state likewise the law declared by the supreme court is binding on all civil authorities in the country by virtue of article 141 of the constitution and this is what has been said in dunlop's case very beautifully by justice jina paredi he uh, he quoted a very beautiful english judgment castle versus broom which was uh, where uh, there was a constant conflict uh, between uh, uh, the court of appeal and house of lords court of appeal in those days was being uh, presided by none other than one of the greatest english judges lord denning and lord denning did not bother a damn about the house of lords and would invariably because he was a innovative judge he would you know take very revolutionary approach to legal issues and he will uh, have his own you know interpretation of the laws so in one such case he defied the house of lords and passed a judgment it came before house of lords and house of lords reprimanded him saying that no 
we are final not because we are final we are final because we are last and you as the court of appeal are bound to uh, you know follow our decisions likewise in that decision supreme court said justice chinna paredi that please all authorities judicial and civil every high court also you are today finding many high courts are refusing to follow supreme court judgments you will find many a times that decisions of the supreme court for example take on on evidence let's take let's test it little differently one of the most fundamental principle of taxation law is that subject can be taxed only if clearly he falls within the four corners of the law that's the law supreme court has laid down for 75 years supreme court also says for 75 years that if two views are possible always take a view which is in favor of the ssc which high court today is willing to follow these principles today i find more often than not the high courts have singularly forgotten this fundamental principles of interpretation of taxing laws and as a result what is happening is that the authorities are becoming emboldened they ignore decisions they ignore principles they just go on passing orders the high courts do not protect the ssc citizens and people are saddled with going to supreme court the admissions in supreme court you know is a toss of coin in 10 or 20 seconds judges may or may not accept your viewpoint and the matters are thrown and making the high court decisions final now this decision of a high court may become final irrespective of the fact that the previous judgments of the supreme court or the principles of law settled by the supreme court are singularly ignored by the high court now this is something which is very troublesome that ultimately you know <clears throat> burden of proof lies entirely on the taxing authorities and that burden has to be discharged by taxing authorities with, with cogent and objective material <clears throat> today what is happening the burden is being shifted to the ssc and the authorities will send a demand which is completely idiotic and expect the ssc then to defend himself and prove to the authorities that this demand is completely you know without any basis now that's not how law should function so there is a complete i would say uh, uh, misapplication of the fundamental principles of interpretation of taxing laws taxing laws have been beautifully interpreted by the supreme court uh, at least in first uh, uh, first 30 years <coughs> i would say right up to 1985 right up to 1985 when uh, justice bhagwati chief justice bhagwati and later chief justice patak were there uh, to some what extent after that chief justice sabesha ji mukherjee was also i would say very balanced and took a in view in favor of the ssc but in last 20 years you find more often than not the chief justices are not interested in taxation laws they are not hearing them the other judges hear them and the old principles are rarely cited and the fault is not only of the authorities the fault is also of us the bar we do not cite the right decisions we never invoke the right principles we just you know we just appear every you know let me say one thing <clears throat> every matter every matter of tax has some constitutional implication and some constitutional connotation it is for us as lawyers to dig out that constitutional connotation and if we can dig it out if we you know three things are most important besides palkiwala's book which my good friend uh, uh, arvind datar one of the finest lawyers today in the country is now edited Uh, and some day you should have him over to you know discuss because he knows your subject more brilliantly than i do and he can be of great as, uh, help to all of you great guy but the principles of income tax laws is one aspect the aspects of you know interpretation take for example gp singh's book on interpretation of statutes that is something where there is a fantastic chapter on interpretation of taxing statutes and the basic principles of interpretation of taxing statute are brilliantly brought out by gp singh in his book take the book on administrative law by justice thakkar none other than justice thakkar from the gujarat i go later came to supreme court 
Justice C. K. Thakkar, in his book on administrative law, has really beautifully defined what is judicial review, what is uh, you know ultra-virus decision, what is the way administrative authorities can act, when do they step outside their jurisdiction, what kind of jurisdictions are there, what kind of actions are bad. Everything has been beautifully discussed by him in a chapter on judicial review of uh, executive actions. Now, these are the two books, besides, of course, the best constitutional law book by Durgadas Basu, the two volumes on constitutional law, particularly on Article 191 G, Article 14, 265, and 300 capital A. The, you know, the judgments are, uh, the commentaries are so good and they are so beautifully defined, you know, the law that one would really enjoy reading them. If you, if we were to, as lawyers, assist the court, we have to insist, oh, okay, we have to insist with the judges and the authorities that this is what the constitutional law is. Please stand reminded of it. it they can ignore it at first stage. They can ignore it at second stage. But they won't be able to ignore it at third stage, tribunal stage, or certainly not at the High Court and Supreme Court stage. So it is for us lawyers who should be really very, very clear about how we want to defend our clients. And, you know, if we take a very casual approach, as we do, I mean, more often than not, I find that we as lawyers take a very, very casual approach. Most lawyers, even arguing in the Supreme Court, are uh, unfortunately not uh, fully prepared on the law. I mean, it is, it's very surprising that sometimes even the most basic principles, which are you know, laid down by the Supreme Court decisions are not cited to the judges. And the matters are argued so perfunctorily, uh, so casually, uh, who suffers? See, ultimately we must realize one thing, that it is not just the doctor who, in whose hands the life of a citizen rests. The life of a citizen also rests economically in the hands of a lawyer. A physical death is one aspect. Economic death is equally disturbing for a citizen. And a lot of times people have suffered you know, immensely because of wrongful actions of the taxing authorities. They have been ruined. Their businesses have been ruined. So we as lawyers have a bounden duty to ensure that we assist our clients as best as we can. And if we fail there, then I think there is a very, very serious uh, uh, issue that uh, we have to... Uh, so Bar Association, and for that, I must tell you one thing, that having been a president of the Supreme Court Bar Association, uh, you know, in, uh, for three times, Bar Associations have a very uh, serious uh, role to play for the society because Constitution really envisages rule of law. And without rule of law, at least a strong rule of law, democracy is in peril. Very few people realize this. Very few people think that law courts means only deciding disputes between you know, citizens, inter se, etc. No. The law courts are the ultimate protector of the constitution. And if we don't realize that, which and if we don't advertise that to citizens, there are serious issues in this country. Why is it today that governance in India is at its lowest ebb? There is virtually nothing called governance today. No government, I mean, and every uh, prime minister who has got majority, be it Mrs. Gandhi, Rajiv Gandhi, or Sri Narendra Bhai Modi, every prime minister who gets absolute majority in last three decades, four decades, has tended to, you know, amass authoritative powers uh, unto himself or herself. Now, that really means that constitution is seriously compromised. Constitution is jeopardized. Constitutional guarantees become meaningless. Fundamental rights are absolutely useless. Now, unless and until we as lawyers are conscious of the rule of law, which is the basic uh, foundation of a strong democracy, unless we are willing to you know, ensure that rule of law is observed by the authorities. As tax lawyers, you have to ensure that rule of law is observed from the taxation perspective, fair enough. But it also involves constitutional perspective because fundamental right of every assessee is 
that he cannot be treated arbitrarily. He cannot be treated discriminatorily. He's, uh, he cannot be saddled with tax without the authority of law. And his business, he certainly can't be, you know, imposed unreasonable restrictions on his business so that his business is not allowed to prosper. All this is very, very important for rule of law. It's not a simple matter. Please do not look at constitutional provisions in isolation for the purpose of academic debate. No, it has a larger purpose to be subserved. And that purpose is this, as I said, that from a, from a taxation perspective, the rule of law, if it is well maintained, you all know what is happening today on the ground, much more than I do. You know how taxing authorities behave. You know how tribunals are functioning. You know how the high courts are today deciding matters. So, you know, at every stage, you are finding more and more, at least I, after 42 years, I can definitely say that I'm deeply disappointed at the functioning of the judicial system. I love judiciary. My father was a judge. I have been a lawyer for 42 years. I swear by judiciary. And I can dare say that if I had to do anything else in life, I'll be a total failure. I can only be, you know, now die as a lawyer. But am I happy being a lawyer today? The answer is no. I mean, the kind of happiness that I got in 1978, when I was a young lawyer, when I would stand up and even show, I remember there was a case uh, which was under the uh, Town Planning Act uh, for a, a, for a, uh, for <coughs> for a trust in uh, Baroda called Arya Kanya Vidyale. I remember that 78, 79, I had just begun practice three, four months ago. And this brief came as an independent brief to me from Baroda. And uh, I raised the point before Justice P.D. Desai was sitting on the read side singly that day, <clears throat> uh, challenging the town planning authorities action uh, of uh, uh, passing certain uh, you know, town planning uh, areas in, uh, which were cutting the uh, school's, uh, you know, premises into half. And I, I cited a very beautiful 200 year old judgment of English court, Bishop versus Oxford. And there the uh, House of Lords had said 200 years ago that if the authorities address themselves to irrelevant considerations, if they do not take into account relevant considerations, then the action of the authorities is bad. And believe you me, when I cited that, from that day onwards, I had won over the trust of Justice P.D. Desai. After that, Justice P.D. Desai always looked at me, as, even as a young lawyer, with a lot of affection and regard. Because, you know, he, he, I mean, it was so, you know, nice to, you know, see that and enjoy it. Now, this is something which we must understand as lawyers, that we must constantly strive to take the law to as great a height as possible. And never think that even a small case is only to be seen from the perspective of an income tax provision or an income tax rule or an income tax exemption. No. In every case, if you start looking for it, there will be issues of you know, constitutional law, there'll be issues of interpretation of statutes, there'll be issues of fundamental principles of taxing laws. All that will be, you know, omnipresent. It's a, only a matter of digging it out. And then the joy of, you know, putting that across in your brief and then presenting it to the income tax officer or the appellate officer or the tribunal or the high court is entirely different then you have developed a new you know, way of uh, examining the matter. We may or may not succeed. That's not the issue. We may or may not succeed. I'm not for a moment saying that all these will uh, get a success. No, but at least we will be confronting the authorities to think about their powers, their limitations. Unless you do that, how, how are we going to really challenge them? We have to challenge them with law. We can't challenge them outside the law. And the more we make it difficult for them to really pass illegal orders, the better it will be for the SSE, your client, but the group of SSEs, the society at large. And let us understand one thing, you know, and this is where very few of us are today able to understand. With 1.4 billion people in this country, can this country ever succeed 
unless we start respecting our business community i am not for a moment suggesting that the dishonest people should be respected i have contempt for dishonest taxpayers no keep them out but we need good business now how will good business really prosper everybody is not uh, everybody is not azim premji of wipro or uh, sun pharma or uh, torrent or uh, zydus or nirma that they can you know de develop even in the most hostile circumstances and become giants we are talking about ordinary businessman who is today treated uh, as a third rate citizen by tax authorities and the high courts don't even protect them so we need today fast industrialization our people are comparable to the best in the world in terms of enterprise indians are outstanding i mean india till 1947 controlled more than 15% of the world trade it's only now that we don't even control 1% surat was we all know was a very well developed port of uh, 600 700 years ago and lothal just outside amdabad was a port which was utilized thousands of years ago so india and indians have been extraordinary in terms of their enterprise in terms of their knowledge in terms of their skills and in terms of their courage all that today is being singularly killed by the governmental authorities we all know the corruption in public life the people who you know tell us says is that you are corrupt are far more corrupt than anybody else we all know what is happening in public life today but the citizens are being subjected to insults subjected to ill treatment good citizens i mean bad citizens of course deserve to be caught nobody minds that so unless and until we are able to develop this take for example foreign investment today today a country like india needs a, a trillions of dollars of foreign investment how are you going to develop large infrastructure projects take for example tourism france today 75 million tourists a year how many 75 million we have 10 million most of them are nris now if 75 million tourists come and each one spends even 5000 dollars in india per trip imagine what we are talking about i am very poor in mathematics but you can calculate it 75 into 5000 we are talking about billions and billions of dollars of business we need to take people out of poverty we need to do something about them and we have to begin at the ground level where we create an atmosphere and environment a climate where people are encouraged to go in business today people are afraid to do business because they don't want to be ill treated by the tax authorities so you know unless we create take for example technology do we have in india technology which can really take this country into the next century or even to subserve the people in the present century the answer is no but the foreigner will not come with his technology to india because our courts are unable to protect that technology anybody will do reverse engineering as you all know and will start producing the goods in india in complete violation of patent rights or in violation of trademark and copyrights so unless and until this kind of an environment is created in the country it is very difficult for us we cannot be an agricultural society today agriculture is very important it is very seriously complementing business but to create jobs we need 10 to 15 million jobs a year since 2014 we are only creating one or two million jobs per year against 10 to 15 million jobs and in demonetization and in six hours lockdown and in the present covid situation we have lost millions of jobs millions of jobs i mean you know what is happening in amdabad for example or in gujarat that every you know job is lost in the restaurant business in hotel business even to look at the lari walas in amdabad alone 50000 lari hase darek lari par be manas kaam karta hase ek lakh lokon nu thayu shu hase e logo kevi rite jeevi shake 
એ રોજની કમાણી કરવા વાળા માણસો છે એમના કુટુંબ ને કેવી રીતે એ લોકો ખાવાનું આપી શકે વી નીડ ટુ ક્રિએટ ધીસ કાઇન્ડ ઓફ એન એટમોસ્ફિયર વિચ વી ડોન્ટ થિંક ધી રીઝન વાય આઈ એમ ડિબેટિંગ ધીસ લાર્જર ઇશ્યુ ઇઝ વિથ યુ ઇઝ દેટ અનલેસ એન અન્ટીલ વી કેન સ્ટ્રેન્ધન ધ ટેક્સ રેજીમ tax must be paid tax has to be paid i i can tell you share with you as a lawyer i i receive every year several crores of rupees in cash but on the same day it is deposited in bank and receipts are issued in 42 years i have never ever touched cash in my life and everything that i do in my life is through credit cards or checks including marriages of my children nothing is ever ever utilized in cash so you know it's it's something i mean lot of people tell me that why is it that you want to pay the tax when you know it is being wasted by the government but that's our our duty our obligation to society society has given us the nation has given us a lot we must give it back i know it is being wasted as prime minister rajiv gandhi had said so many years ago that every for every 1 rupee spent by government only 20 paisa goes to the people 80 paisa is eaten away in inefficiency or corruption i know that but still i must do my duty so what i am trying to tell you is that there is a very serious role that we as lawyers have to perform and that role is to strengthen rule of law to strengthen the administration of taxing and that can be done only by letting tax authorities know what is the constitutional mechanism what is the parameters of the constitution what are the limitations of the constitution so far as your tax is concerned mr income tax mr customs and mr excise inspector and what is it that your jurisdiction is unless and until we do that we will not subserve the constitution we will not subserve the rule of law and we certainly will not subserve the nation so i respectfully urge that please do do consider this as my thoughts as uh, my i i won't say my advice but as my thoughts because as you very rightly said knowledge i would definitely say gyan to ganu ganu mahatvapurna che darek ni jindagi ma pan bandhanan nu gyan apde ek nagrik tarike sauthi vadare job important che ane e sathe hu aapno sabno aabhar manu chu thank you very very much mane aape bulavyo ખૂબ આનંદની વાત હતી અને આ સુંદર એક મોકો હતો કે એલજી ઠક્કર સાહેબની યાદમાં આ મેમોરિયલ લેક્ચર રાખવામાં આવ્યું આઈ થેન્ક ધી ટેક્સ એડવોકેટ્સ એસોસિએશન ઓફ ગુજરાત ફોર ઇન્વાઇટિંગ મી એન્ડ ઇટ્સ બીન અ રિયલ પ્લેઝર એન્ડ પ્રિવિલેજ ટોકિંગ ટુ યુ થેન્ક યુ વેરી વેરી મચ થેન્ક યુ સો મચ સર દુષ્યન દવે સર યુ હેવ એનલાઇટન્ડ અસ વંડરફુલી સર સર the forum is open for the question answer one question we have received in the chat box sir can i take sir please sir the first question which is there in the chat box is tax related cases are civil suits in such cases the ssc's counsel cannot plead that ssc is of good character and cannot indulge in tax evasion because character is not a relevant fact in civil suit as per section 55 of the indian evidence act no you are not, <coughs> you are not pleading character but you certainly are entitled to show the past uh, transactions or past tax behavior of the ssc and show that if the ssc has been in business for 10 or 20 or 30 years and ssc has paid or discharged this tax liability fairly and honestly then that's a factor which can always be relied upon to tell that this allegation of evasion if it is not backed by you know concrete evidence cogent evidence is clearly unlawful unwarranted and this is not an ssc who has ever behaved like this that's a aspect which certainly will weigh with a civil court or a high court in uh, you know uh, uh, in arriving at a decision so the question is further extended that 
However, if the prosecution proceeding is instituted against SSE under Income Tax Act, then it is a criminal shoot. In criminal shoot, character is a relevant fact as per Section 52 of the Indian Evidence Act. Then can SSE's counsel plead that SSE is of good character and procure immunity from prosecution by furnishing evidence about SSE's good character? See, there can't be any uh, uh, any license. Uh, if you have violated the Income Tax Act, you have violated. Good character does not come in the way. It may come in the way. I mean, it may help you for the purpose of sentencing, but not for the purpose of conviction. So good character ultimately, uh, in a, but as I said earlier, even in a criminal trial, you are entitled to uh, establish that the authorities have not produced a cogent and clear evidence to establish that my client has committed any violation of the law. And in that regard, you can always speak about the past conduct of your client and persuade the judge that please kindly see that for 30 years or 20 years, nothing has ever been alleged against me. This allegation, which is unsubstantiated, therefore is completely bogus. And therefore the court should not convict me on such bogus evidence. So that's something which can be argued certainly. The two questions are related to the uh, GST Act, sir. In GST Act, one section 164 says that power of government to make rules. And that 164, subsection 3 says, the power to make rules conferred by this section shall includes the power to give retrospective effect to the rules or any of them from a date not earlier than the date on which the provisions of this act came into force. Sir, now the retrospective powers are given to make the amendment retrospectively. Sometimes we, we see that in the income tax or in the GST, earlier in the VAT or sales tax, if some decision law, come in favor of SSE. Law, law is very clear. The yeah. rulemaking authority has no power to bring any provision retrospectively. It's only the parliament or the legislature which can uh, you know, legislate prospectively or retrospectively. <coughs> the rulemaking authority has no power whatsoever. And there are a series of judgments of the Supreme Court. If you will look at G.P. Singh's book on this, you will find series of judgments where Supreme Court has said rulemaking power cannot re uh, legislate uh, retrospectively. So but, that's period. I mean, this power, therefore, I have not seen the exact provision, but if this is the provision to my mind, it is unconstitutional. Sir, uh, let me clear about this 164. Subsection 1 says the government may, on the recommendations of the council by notification, make rules for carrying out the provisions of this act. Whichever it is, the rulemaking authority can be given uh, the power to sometimes make rules retrospectively. But a general power like this should be tested before a court, I think. Then one more question related to the GST. Where under Section 16, if the purchaser has genuinely made the purchase transaction, then he is entitled to get the input tax credit. Now, the, one of the conditions is that if the supplier has not paid the tax for any reason, then the purchaser is not entitled to get input tax credit. This... <laughs> This is a problem which I have faced for the last 30 years. You know, uh, TDS is being deducted. We don't get TDS certificates as senior advocates. And uh, I, I have been saddled with large liability by income tax authorities in Gujarat alone, where I am assessed. So it is a problem which is very, although Income Tax Act very categorically says that person who deducts the TDS is under an obligation to pay. And if he doesn't pay, he's liable to be prosecuted. But I have not seen a single prosecution against these kind of people. Rather, we are being made to suffer that uh, you are not producing the TDS certificate. And therefore, if we show, supposing my bill is, let's say, 1 lakh, and I get 90,000 rupees, 10,000 is deducted as TDS. I can say that, look, I received 90,000, he has deducted 10,000 as TDS. It's for the authorities to run after him, but they don't do it. It's absolutely, you know, this is this kind of behavior is really a very, I would say, sad behavior because this is to punish honest taxpayers. And it, it really goes unpunished, uh, unfortunately. Can the taxpayer can have any shelter as far as constitutional rights? Yes, of course. Of course, taxpayer will be fully protected. He should file a writ petition and ask for a mandamus against the authority 
that tell authorities to run after this gentleman right then under the income tax act the cbdt has given the instructions to the assessing officer that whenever there is a demand is raised even the assc is advised to pay 20% tax or 20% of the demand rather now this is only a rather a direction there is absolutely like a instruction it is not in the law now all officers are instruct following this instruction of making payment of 20% to the assessor whether it is a high pitch assessment or whatever it is then they will have to uh, knock the door of the court is it not challenged so far in gujarat high court there are there are at least 100 judgments that i know of uh, under various tax laws sales tax income tax excise customs where the supreme court has said or high courts have said that such instructions can never be issued and are not binding on the subordinate authorities yes but generally at the procedural or administrative level they are not following but you have to challenge you have to challenge them the, you know in fact i will tell you something very uh, amusing that i remember when J justice kirpal was the chief justice of gujarat high court he had some you know uh, uh, circular issued by the high court uh, to all the subordinate courts of gujarat that do not grant ex parte injunction now it was completely wrong you know why it was done very surprising because everybody who wanted to file a case for infringement of trademark or copyright would rush to delhi high court and get an ex parte injunction all that you had to show was some rapper or having purchased a little thing in delhi and jurisdiction of delhi court was assumed so i have said publicly many a times in hearings to delhi high court that you all have benefited at the cost of other high courts so so it's not just the income tax authority it is but even somebody like chief justice kirpal had such a circular issued in gujarat and nobody really objected to it right uh, one of the section in gst act is section 157 that is the protection of action taken under this act now these all protections are given to the officers of the department that you cannot take any actions against them or you cannot any file any suit or prosecution or legal proceedings against them whether it is uh, acceptable as far as constitution is concerned section 157 they, they protect only the lawful actions they do not protect unlawful actions so that distinction must be made out if you can establish that the action of a particular officer was unlawful it was malafide or it suffered from legal malice even if it is not malafide then this section cannot afford any protection to anyone <clears throat> sir forum is open for another 2 uh, 3 minutes if anybody is having any question what is if i can add sir yes yeah. uh mushan sir this is with regard to gst only but a general question uh, gst is about to complete 4 years in this particular end of this month and uh, the most important uh, aspect for a gst to be successful is the federal structure and you are more aware than me that the federal structure is very fragile and at times acrimonious uh how do you see the future of gst in such a federal disturbed or a fragile uh, federal structure this is a and b is the fact that uh, uh, one has to be whether it is legislature administration or uh, the judiciary transparency is the need of the r uh, but so far as the collegium system of the courts is concerned uh, there is a big question mark with regard to the transparency and it could be is seen as a much opaque system uh, i would like to uh, get your comments on that sir yes sir one thing we you must remember this country this is something very sad it never happens in any other country there is complete absence of accountability in this country nobody is accountable for their unlawful actions in public life nobody and you know this is something which is very very i would say uh, uh, it's a sad commentary on us and this is where there is a complete failure of constitutional morality take criminal jurisprudence in a country like japan the success rate of prosecutions is 99.99% in india it is just about 16% why because in japan no officer can dare file a false prosecution against a citizen 
in india everybody goes and files bogus prosecutions against anybody and everybody take for example sedition law all kinds of people are being charged with sedition you make a statement you tweet against the prime minister sedition you tweet against the home minister sedition what is happening to this country you can't run a country like that where all kinds of false prosecutions are being launched against people and 16% conviction rate we are not safe today in our own homes because the you know the the legal structure uh, the rule of law is seriously jeopardized today very seriously jeopardized and that should never have happened now the real problem is as uh, 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 what what was your question about gst you said it depends on the uh, federal structure and right yes. now it is right that, now there there is something very interesting <clears throat> that for almost 8 or 9 years prime minister shri narendra modi when he was chief minister of gujarat vehemently opposed gst at one stage he said over my dead body when he goes as prime minister he suddenly realizes the importance of gst and how central government can become all powerful and control the states he therefore passes gst today every state has become a beggar their dues are not paid even if they are paid they are never paid on time and the states are really at a serious loss in running you know it is directly affecting the federal structure because there are no other avenues of income why do you think during covid the single largest source of income for states like delhi or punjab or karnataka or maharashtra was alcohol why do you think that they are willing to send alcohol at home to people because that's a single source of income for these states and they are not getting their rightful dues from the central government nirmala sitaraman does not release the funds on time does not release them as demanded by the state or as they are due to the state federal structure is seriously under challenge today in this country in many ways in many ways take for example delhi delhi is an was supposed to be an independent state it has an elected government kejriwal is the chief minister of delhi now parliament passes a law and says that all decisions will be taken by the lieutenant governor who is controlled by uh, government of india and home minister shri amit shah no decision can be taken by elected body and when the elections took place in 2014 i remember when first time kejriwal defeated bjp <laughs> after the general election <laughs> prime minister modi during his campaign promise us india that if you elect us the bjp we will give full statehood to the uh, delhi complete statehood now you lose you just you take away every which way the power now this is something which is uh, take for example uh, you know uh, uh, the, you know uh, the west bengal just recent election during the election you don't speak about this bogus uh, corruption case Uh, some tapes or something tapes also involved one of their own now mlas the leader of the opposition yeah. mr adhikari once the elections are lost you yeah. go and try and arrest some mlas and uh, ministers of the government yeah. now these are all striking at the very nature of the federal structure the cbi was never intended to be used by political masters it's not bjp alone who's doing it congress did that as well so all governments at the center somehow want to strike at the federal structure and weaken the states how many times congress dismissed the uh, governments in states which were controlled by the opposition right from the 50s in kerala so you know it's not just bjp which is dismissing all these governments by shamdam ben and dan <clears throat> even congress did that the federal structure unfortunately in this country has become weaker and that was never i mean imagine anything like this happening in america it is impossible so you know the because the constitution in america is so beautifully preserved so beautifully implemented it is absolutely watertight nobody can go outside the constitution if <clears throat> president trump said i remember that we will attack iran and we will destroy all their ancient sites now iran has a historical sites which are 3 4 000 years old the chief of the army of united states of america said next day that if president trump gives me that direction that command i will disobey it 
Now, you know, look at, look at the, when he took over, I remember when he took over as president, he wanted certain, uh, you know, countries to be barred from allowing, uh, you know, uh, citizenship or visas. And he therefore forced uh, the uh, acting assistant uh, so, uh, attorney general of United States to sign that file. She refused. She said, I am not bound by the president. I am bound by the constitution of India. Now, how many people in India can stand up? Nobody is willing to stand up and say that. Every law officer, including our attorney general, I mean, if the vaccine policy is being debated today, should the attorney general stand up and defend this vaccine policy? Is every citizen not entitled to free vaccine? We always got free BCG or polio or other vaccines when we were children. Nobody paid for it. Where is the debate? If you, want, if you don't have money, then tax these rich people who have made billions and billions of dollars in last one year. The wealth of Ambani and Adani alone, if you tax 30% as well tax, will be good enough to serve any kind of a vaccine policy in the country. Because you will easily get 50,000 crore from them. So, you know, it's, it's something which we don't have any accountability left in this country. There is, there is no, uh, the appointment of Supreme Court judges, let me tell you very clearly, or High Court judges, since 1992, when Supreme Court grabbed the power from the executive to appoint judges and formed this collegium system, which they think is a great gift of Supreme Court to the uh, mankind in India, it has really done great disservice to judiciary. Some of the worst judges have been appointed to high courts and Supreme Court by the collegium. Some of the worst, including series of chief justices of India. Series of chief justices. I mean, can you imagine a chief justice is charged with sexual harassment and gets away? In any other country, he would have had to resign within half an hour. So we have today become, and you know, if you read this judgment, 1992 judgment in Advocate on Record Association, what is known as the second judge's appointment case, that judgment very beautifully, Justice Verma speaking for the court says that we must have fiercely independent judges and we must select best from amongst those available. Now we all know that in the bar, Take, for example, Gujarat, how many top class lawyers are practicing who are worthy of being appointed as high court judge? But they will be appointed by Congress government if they feel that they have a Congress philosophy. They will be appointed by BJP government if they think that they have a BJP philosophy or RSS philosophy and the collegiums agree to that. There is no transparency. If anybody thinks that these appointments are transparent and are purely on merit, then you are mistaken. Maybe out of 100 appointments, five maybe are on pure merit. Take, for example, judges like Justice Nariman, Justice uh, uh, you know, Chandrachur, Justice uh, uh, Lalit, all these people you know, in recent years were appointed purely on merits. But there are many whom I don't want to cite. I mean, I can cite people who are on merit, but I can't cite people who are unmeritorious. But large number of appointments have been made which were unmeritorious. And there is no transparency. You ask them a question, they never reply. I have written three letters against three prospective Supreme Court judges, giving concrete evidence to the collegium. Concrete. They were all appointed except in one case. The fourth case, uh, I fortunately succeeded. But in three cases, they didn't even care to reply to my letter. <clears throat> And as a result, you have got judges, uh, you know, to Supreme Court who should not be there, who are highly political, who are who were highly, you know, compromised politically, and their decisions reflected that. So you know, it is it is something very sad for us that we are unable to withstand the attacks on the constitution and constitutional morality every second. We need a very, very strong nation where constitutional morality is respected as best as possible. There is none today. There is none today. Yes, sir. Uh, only last question is there in chat box, then we will conclude it within five minutes. Yes, sir. 
the last question is about the bar of limitation specified in section 468 of the code of criminal procedure 1973 would not apply to a prosecution under the income tax act is this not violation of fundamental rights of the ssc meaning thereby that the income tax department could initiate proceedings against an ssc for an offence committed in the past even after the afflux of a substantial amount of time sir yes the the answer to that is unfortunately a very unconstitutional law which has not been tested by anybody it was passed during emergency if i mistake not it is called uh, uh, it is called uh, uh, it is called economic offences a non application of limitation act of 1976 they have listed all these laws income tax excise customs and many other laws under which this limitation has been waived by parliamentary <clears throat> legislation so you are absolutely right it it is really un- impermissible but i don't know whether this the silly law was challenged or not and whether it was upheld or not i won't be surprised if it was challenged and upheld also by my supreme court but to my mind it's a wholly unconstitutional law thank you sir uh, you, <clears throat> i am uh, i am really speechless absolutely outstanding sir as far as your speech is concerned sir and this year sir we had an occasion to have two masters of this supreme court sir as you referred about the datar sir we had an occasion earlier before 6 months back that we have invited sri datar sir also and today sir we have invited the dushyant dave sir sir absolutely outstanding sir a big round of applause for today's speaker as a mark of our love and affection sir may i now request our past president sri ramani sir who is the father of late major rushikesh ramani to present a memento to our today's speaker sri dushyant dave sir ramani sir friends last but not the least may i now request a secretary of our association sri pratik bhai patel to present a vote of thanks and then after i will hand over directly charge to the sunil bhai keswani for any further announcement or proceedings to be followed or not pratik bhai to propose vote of thanks thank you sir at the outset firstly i would like to thank sri sunil bhai keswani president of the tax advocate association gujarat and convener shri vari sisani ji for giving me opportunity to propose word of thanks the eminent speaker of the day senior advocate of supreme court mr dushyant dave sir for giving his talk on overview of constitution rights fundamental rights and indian evidence act taxation from the tax payer perspective i would extend our deep sense of gratitude toward the speaker for sharing the knowledge on the topic which concern all of us and happily announce that the tag jointly with tag ladies wing and gstba organized motivational lecture on jivan jivani jadi buti by dr naresh ves sir on 9th june 2021 lastly i would like to appreciate and acknowledge the strength and support provided by all delegates present here <coughs> and make our webinar successful thank you very much sir thank you so much sir thank you yes okay. our session here sir thank, thank you. you thank you thank, thank you dushan sir thank you one sir thank you everyone sir with the permission we will close the lecture sir thank you thank you very much uh, pratik bhai if you can close the lecture sir okay sir